uh, George. I'm confused whether at time when he says Pentateuchal, all other that means the Torah. That means the Torah. So what he's really in sense he's saying you don't need to read the Torah, but then later no, on no, you do says, need to read the Torah. Well, he's saying this Torah covers the Torah, but later he says it, whoever first reads the written law, yes, and then this compilation has yes. got it all. Yes. So, so he's saying you do this isn't Absolutely. a replacement for the Torah. It's, it's not a replacement for the Torah because don't forget the Torah is read every week in the synagogue, right? So you need to study the Torah because, of course, it is the most sublime revelation, right? You need to know the Torah, and I'm sure he would say it's you know good to uh, to study the other books of the Bible as well. But in terms of Jewish practice, the Torah is the written law, and he has now compiled the oral law for his day. But he, it, be, it, earlier he does say that the, in accordance with the conclusions drawn from these compilations and commentaries that have appeared from the time of Moses to the present. Yes. So that seems to, so that the rules shall be accessible to young and old whether these appertain to the Pentateuchal precepts or to the institutions established by the sages and prophets. Right. So that sounds Torah or Talmud. No, that's tor Torah, Torah law. Remember I spoke at the beginning about the difference between Torah law and Rabbinic law? So he's talking about Torah law, the 613 commandments, which again are not always explicit in the Torah, but he's talking about Torah law and he's talking about Rabbinic ordinances okay. and uh, that okay. were subsequent. Okay. Um, and and the, the, the Talmud makes a distinction between those two, although sometimes they argue over what's a Torah law and what's a rabbinic enactment. Um, and, but, so he's trying, one of the things he tries to make very clear is to what is a Torah law, one of the 613, and what is a rabbinic enactment. And don't forget, rabbinic enactments were considered to be binding, as binding as Torah law. Yes, Brian. Uh, when the Torah says the Torah and the mitzvot, is it are there others who feel that the mitzvot refer to what's in the Torah? As, as you mean what is the, what is actual biblical, well, what does the, the Bible Torah actually says say? The Torah and the mitzvot, one yes. implication seems to be you'll find them all here in the Torah. You're saying no, the mitzvot are things that are opinions rendered outside of the Torah. No, I'm saying that's the rabbis interpreted the double use of more than one term. Because sometimes it wasn't Torah, it was chukim unishpatim, okay, right? Or Torah umitzvot. They interpreted that as referring to both the written and the oral law. Although Kukim and Mishpatim, sometimes they 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 understood to be um, commandments that which the reason is easy to figure out and the other ones that are not. But the exactly. point is, in the only time the word Torah is used of the Torah is in the book of Deuteronomy, and technically speaking, Deuteronomy is talking about itself, and the word Torah means teaching. What rabbinic tradition took it to mean was the whole of the Pentateuch. Okay. Right. So, are there are there any uh, was that a universal opinion that the that whatever was other than Torah was interpretation? Or was the oral law? The oral law. Don't yeah. forget the oral law is is um, complementary to the Torah. Uh, an example is there are a number of times when you're commanded to to practice the Sabbath, but there's actually very little about how to practice the Sabbath in the Torah itself. There are very few rules that you can actually discern. They're more like general statements. And what the oral law does in the Mishnah is to explicate all kinds of laws regarding how you're supposed to practice the Sabbath. So the traditional interpretation, I suppose, would be that even though the mitzvot had not all been enumerated at the time the Torah was given... Not, oh, the oral law was. The written law was given to Moses. This oh, okay. is the rabbinic understanding that there were two Torahs given on Mount Sinai, the written law and the oral law. And the oral law was handed down from Moses to Joshua and then down through all the elders and prophets to the sages in the second temple period and then to the sages of the post-second temple period so that there's this legitimate line of the transmission of the oral law that was always oral until the time of Judah, the, the Hanasi, at the beginning of the... Third, you know, the end of the second century, beginning of the third century, where he compiles the Mishnah, as he said, because things are in a bad state, so it's time to write it down. Because originally there was a prohibition against writing down the oral law. A Why? religious prohibition. Yes, because they did not want people to see the oral law as, ha as being on quite the same. They understood the oral law was a little bit 
lower, so to speak, in sacredness than the written law. And also was probably uh, 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 an apolog you know, kind of a, a, t a polemic against Christianity that was saying we have a new covenant, you know, and all that kind of thing. Yes, Lisa. Was it hypothesized who made the division between the written and the oral? Was it God or was it Moses? Well, it was God. In other words, God said, write this part down, and now I'm going to tell you the rest. I mean, this is, again, the rabbinic interpretation of it. All right, this is the rabbinic view of the world. I understand, but it seems odd that something of such great importance as the oral law should be relegated to a sort of second class. Um, I wouldn't call it second status. class, but but by the way, in the Second Temple period, it was not unusual for Jews to believe uh, in the idea that there were other traditions not written in the Torah that were also binding. In other words, the rabbis were not the only ones to believe that. I mean, Christianity is an example of that, but there were other Jewish groups, like the people who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, who had certain works that they considered to be as authoritative as the Torah. <coughs> okay? And there's, there was evidently that was not unusual in the Second Temple period. It surprises me. <laughs> it's just the way things work. <laughs> I'm allowed to be surprised. Yes. Maybe I'm misled by this term rabbinic. Yes. Because prior to the destruction of the Second Temple, temple, or in any other time, was there a point of view that said that the laws consist of what's in the Torah period? Those stop. were the Sadducees. Period. Stop. The Sadducees didn't believe there was anything other. Jewish law consisted entirely of what was written in the Torah. The Pharisees, who were the ancestors of the rabbis, believed that they were the ones who believed. That's where the idea of the oral law comes out of, is the, is the Pharisees. That was part of their doctrine, um, which Josephus mentions. He doesn't call it the oral law. He calls it traditions of the ancestors and so on. But uh, again, the, the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scroll people had similar ideas about that sort of thing. So it was not unusual in the Jewish world in the Second Temple period to believe that there was other material other than the or than the Torah itself, the written Torah itself. And that that's what evolved. And by the way, one could say with some historical accuracy um, that the Jews in the Second Temple period could not have lived by just the Torah alone, and therefore all kinds of traditions on how to practice the Sabbath, how to practice kashrut, all kinds of things evolved in the Second Temple period that were kind of what you might call Jewish common law that eventually evolved into what the rabbis called the oral law. There's certainly evidence that, uh, that of laws in the Mishnah and practices in the Mishnah that are quite ancient. It's, a, it's an argument among scholars. How much, did the, how much comes from post-destruction uh, temple, how much comes before, it's difficult to say because it was written down so long. But, I mean, there are times when you can find certain things in the Mishnah and you can find similar things in, in other you know, pre-destruction you know, sources like the Dead Sea Scrolls like Philo, like Josephus, you can say, well, the mission is reflecting long-held Jewish practices that predate the rabbis. And, you know, scholars are, you know, have worked on this particular issue. We're going to stop there. Um, 